I'm going to take you through now a very simple approach to development feasibility. Sometimes in the trade, people in the development world talk about doing their calculations on the back of an envelope. And this is because the basic question, the basic calculation that you need to work out whether an investment is going to be viable or not really is that simple. It only takes a few lines and anyone with a bit of experience is able to do it literally on the back of an envelope to work out whether they're going to make a reasonable rate of profit on projects that might be worth tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. And so the scale is not that important. The important thing is to know what the numbers are that are going to go into that handful of calculations, really just a couple of additions and subtractions, that you can do, as I say, on the back of an envelope. The purpose of this is not to say that this is the way to do development feasibility, but you will find that when you're talking to development people or if you're involved in the industry yourself, once you learn the construction costs and the other overhead costs, the government charges, the processes and delays that are involved in getting development approval and so on, really development gets to be that easy. And usually people will tell you what the cost of construction are, the total cost of construction are as an indicator which are sufficient for making decisions whether to go ahead and use something more elaborate, such as the kind of models that we're going over in other parts of this module, or something like the Estate Master DF model. That's not to say that the DF model is not to be used, in fact, most larger developments will, but simply that this rule of thumb approach has a definite merit, and it underlines the fact that really you don't need to go to university to be a successful developer. And in fact, many of the large development country, companies today got started as small-time builders who simply got on top of the very basic calculation and had a good understanding of the costs and the revenues involved. And this is really the end point here, that getting to know the environment that you're working in the costs, the opportunities, the revenues and so on is really the key thing. This comes from experience. It doesn't come out of a textbook. It's important that you use the textbooks to understand the background theory, absolutely, but your practice day to day comes from knowing your markets, knowing your environment. Let's have a look now at how to do the simplest of uh, development feasibility models. In this example, we have a developer who wants a quick indication of what to pay for land upon which a 20-storey commercial building may be constructed. This is really the core question. How the data comes to us uh, is quite variable. The developer may already have the, uh, some of the, the data laid out, but generally we're going to assume uh, a fairly simple approach that you would use to do this quick calculation, perhaps relying on something like your Rawlinson's construction handbook to get an indication of values and so on and your experience in the industry. The core calculation is in this area of cells from rows 24 to 28. The first few rows merely set up the initial parameters and the last three, the ground rent calculations, really is a little bit of an extra that we're putting in here to keep the kind of theme that we have within this unit of looking at partial rents and ground rents and so on. So the real back of the envelope calculation really only consists of about five calculations, even though there might be one or two extras that we might add on. So let's look at what's involved. First of all, we want to look at uh, what income is possible from this property. Now we've been given the gross floor area. Now it's important to realize that when you build buildings, especially buildings that you're going to intend to rent out, not all of the building is able to earn you rent, typically. If you build a commercial tower, for instance, there's going to be the you know, the access core, the lift shafts, the um, toilet area, things like that, that are not going to be able to earn you any rent, the entrance uh, foyer at the front and, and so on. And so there's a difference between the gross floor area of the building and what we call the net lettable area. And so that's the area that you're able to earn income from. 
and to get from the gross floor area or GFA to the net lettable area which is the business part of it if you like we talk about a quantity known as the building efficiency in this case we're saying the building efficiency is 90 percent so this should be a very easy calculation we simply take the gross floor area we multiply it by the building efficiency which is 90 percent and that tells us that we've got 36,000 square meters of net lettable area that we can earn rent on now we have the net rental on completion we're given the rate of net rent which is 900 meters at uh, $900 per square meter we've got the NLA the net lettable area and so we again simply do a multiplication here and now we have thirty two million four hundred thousand dollars per annum coming in to whoever is the landlord for that building we also have the market yield and so we can capitalize that net operating income the net rental by the market yield to get the value of the building on completion so here we're going to simply take the net rent capitalize it by dividing by the market yield so that tells us that our building is going to be worth 270 million dollars lovely good that's our revenue if you like and as I say in some cases you might have that value as your starting point and so if it's like a preliminary for the calculations we're going to be doing nothing difficult there now we're going to look at the gross construction cost well again let's look at what we get out of Cordell's it might be three thousand eight hundred dollars per meter let's say for a particular area and quality of finish and so on onto that we're going to add some allowance for professional and statutory fees that's things like getting your development approval government rates and taxes architects engineers project management fees and that sort of stuff and we're going to be applying in this case 15 percent so it means that the gross construction cost as a rate per square meter is not the 3,800 we get out from Cordell's but rather 3,800 multiplied by 1 plus our allowance 15% where do we get the allowance from where do we get the 15% from that's from experience if you're doing this for the first time and you don't have the benefit of someone to give you an indication of what to allow there it's a matter of going through and adding all these things up finding what the professional fees are going to be what the other overheads are adding up the um, approval fees and all of that stuff and you can do that by referring either to construction cost guides that will give you an idea of the professional fees uh, you can also make inquiries to architects engineers local council and so on and you basically get all those numbers together so we're using 15 percent here it might be 20 percent might be 8 percent depends on the project and as I say it comes down to experience but that's the calculation again quite easy we've got a rate to the gross cost to construct per square meter here to get the total construction cost we simply multiply the construction rate the gross construction rate by the uh, gross floor area and that gives us 174 million eight hundred thousand now that's the neat cost if you like that's the number of dollars that are going to go out of my pocket if I'm the developer I'm going to want to allow some allowance for my profit and risk what I'm going to call my developer margin up here I'm saying that my developer margin I'm going to want 30 percent on top of those costs and so what I'm going to do is gross that 174 million up by my margin and so I'm going to multiply that by one plus my margin very easy 227 million 240,000 and so what I have now is the value on completion 270 million and the total cost that I have to get recouped including my profit and risk and so that gives you my costs now this is for the actual building and so if I take one of those from the other I end up with how much profit I'm going to make before I think about buying land and in fact that 
$42,760,000 is my profit if the land comes for free, which it probably won't, or notionally, the amount that I can pay for the land and still make my 30% margin. This is really important, that the margin is built into these calculations, so I can uh, be able to spend the full 42 0.75, um, 0.76 million dollars on the land and still make a comfortable income. Okay, now because I'm buying land pretty much up front, I need to allow for the fact that that's also going to have my margin in it. And so I need to take the net value of the land. Okay, I need to take the 30% out of that. Now I do that in a way which you may have done in business studies at school or in business mathematics in some other unit. We simply take this number, we're going to divide it by 1 plus the 30%. So that gives us the value of uh, that 42 million once I've removed from it the 30% which I need for my pocket. So what, means, what that means is that I can spend $32,892,308 on the land, add 30% which is my margin, which grosses it up to the $42,760,000 and everything works out nicely and I'm making 30% overall. Now those five calculations, rows 24 to 28, are the whole sum of the calculation I need to work out whether I can make a profit, a 30% margin, on a project which is going to end up uh, returning to me a revenue of $270 million. That's all you need. That's almost scarily simple. And you should be able to do that sort of stuff in your sleep, on the back of an envelope, or what have you. It's not to say that this is what everyone is going to do when they consider the feasibility of a project worth, well, over a quarter of a billion dollars, but it can be done, it has been done, and it certainly gives you a good ballpark starting point. Okay, that's the end of the exercise, basically. Just to make it a little tiny bit more interesting, I'm just going to quickly run through a little bit more. I'm going to work out the ground rent that would be appropriate here. Now I've worked out the land value, that's a 32 point something million dollars. The ground rent uh, is simply going to be that times the ground rent yield, which I get from the market. So that gives me a figure there for ground rent. Take the decimal points out because they're a bit meaningless. So about $2.6 million per year is available uh, for ground rent. Now what we can do is work out the rent available for the building. This is simply the rent on the property as a whole, which we have above, less the ground rent. That gives us a amount of rent or the proportion of the rent that goes into an investor's pocket who might be holding the uh, property through its economic life. We can do all sorts of involved, discounted analyses of the investor situation, but a very simple measure, non-discounted, is to work out the payback period uh, for that rent to repay the cost, the total development cost, that's the cost uh, including the developer's margin. So here we simply take the total construction cost including the developers margin we divide it by the annual rent available for the building and we get a payback period of 7.6 years uh, and the investor can then look at that 7.6 years and decide whether that looks like a reasonable development that can also be expressed as a yield now, in this, you'll notice that we haven't really taken account of time. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the construction period is in this model because we're not doing any discounting. We haven't considered finance, so there's no interest costs and so on involved. Very, very simple calculation. However, with the right loadings and using the right data, it can give you a fair indication of 
the feasibility of a development and certainly is a good first start before you devote the resources to uh, running through an entire estate master model or something like that. So there you have it, frightfully simple. In fact, even the model that we've just looked at has been given a little bit of uh, frill in the way that we looked at the question of ground rents and so on. In fact, you can leave that part out. What are you left with? A handful, and literally a handful, of very simple calculations. And as I said in the introduction, the important thing here is to first of all have the confidence to understand how development is done, and maybe the theory behind it. They're important. But at the end of the day, to make money out of development, the most important thing is to know your markets, know your costs of construction, the process that you have to go through, the delays which will cost you money, and as long as you have that under control, then you'll find that in a rising market there will be plenty of opportunities, and even in a stable, growing community, development can be quite a rewarding area of the property profession.